Hi, my name is Harald Sack. Welcome to Knowledge Graphs. This is lecture number one, Knowledge Representation with Graphs. In this very first part of the lecture, we are going to tell you how to get from data to knowledge. Okay, let me start with a simple question. What's that? Of course now you would tell me, yeah, 42, what's that? Just let's ask for example ChatGPT. If I ask ChatGPT, to make it simple for us of course, what is number 42? It tells you of course, yeah, it's a number. It's an integer and a non-negative number in the decimal system. It is the number following 41 and preceding 43. Yeah, it's clear like that. It's often used as a placeholder for a number or value that is currently unknown or unspecified and so on. But you see also farther down here in the definition that it also has a different meaning. For example, it's related to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, in which 42 is described as the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything, calculated by an enormous supercomputer named Deep Thought over a period of shortly 7.5 million years. For sure, you see, we have here already two different meanings, but that's not all. So I simply ask, what else could it be? And you see here, ChatGPT gives me several different answers, like for example here in Tarot, number 42 is associated with the card, the world, which represents completion, wholeness, and the integration of all aspects of the self. In numerology, again, it's considered to be a highly spiritual number that represents the realization of a higher purpose or goal. Interestingly, in Chinese culture, 42 somehow is considered unlucky because, and this is because of the four, that's a homophone for death in Mandarin. In the Bible also 42 appears several times and you see here, for example, in the story of the flood, there it said that the rain lasted for 42 days and 42 nights and so on. And even more here, for example, in the Mayan calendar, 42 represents the end of a cycle as well as the beginning of a cycle. In psychology, it's a, uh, often used as a random number. In computer science, it's a placeholder or a default value. And in physics, 42 is, for example, the atomic number of molybdenum. That's a chemical element with the symbol MO. Probably you have seen it. And of course, then also, um, again, it's referred to in popular culture as the number 42 from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So, what is now 42? If you simply see 42, as kind of a raw data, then it can be a quantity, a point in time, a time span, a length, a weight, a measurement, a code, a character string, it can be anything. To determine what it really is, we need more information. So we need more information to make sense of that data. So what is data again? Data in itself, it's raw. It simply exists and it has no significance beyond its existence in and of itself. And it can exist in any kind of form, whether it's usable or not. It doesn't matter, it's just data. If you want to make use of it, you need more. Then we come in the realm of information. So what's information? Information, of course, is also data, but it's data that has been given meaning by way of relational connections. So there the data is related with each other. And this meaning that is created there, that can be useful for your purpose, but it doesn't have to be. Such kind of information is often contained in descriptions and information answers to questions that usually begin with a W word, such as who, what, when, where or how many. But that's just information. We are not already in the realm of being useful. Useful information or information becomes useful when we are talking about knowledge. So what's knowledge? Knowledge is an appropriate collection of information such that its intent is to be useful. And if you go further, if you accumulate knowledge over time and then reflect about your knowledge, it might become wisdom, which is the ability to make sound judgments and decisions. And the way how to get there from data over information to knowledge and finally to wisdom is of course understanding, which is also one of the main topics here of the first parts here of the lecture. Understanding is the continuum that leads from data through information and knowledge and ultimately to wisdom. 
And these four components, data information, knowledge and wisdom, together they form the so-called DIKW pyramid, introduced by Aikoff in 1989. So you have in the bottom layer there data as raw characters and symbols. And then of course data can be transformed into information by convention. It might be usable. It's in a usable form, but it's not necessarily intended to be useful there, as we have seen. Then in the next step, of course, by cognition, information transforms into knowledge. There you have information which is enriched with semantics, with meaning, so it's meaningful information. And further on, if you further contemplate over the knowledge, you finally reach the stage of wisdom. The, let's say, fundamental difference between wisdom and all of the other three components is that knowledge, information and data refers to the past, to your experience. And you can explain things going on in the past. However, whenever you have accumulated wisdom, you are also able to apply that kind of wisdom to make predictions about the future, about novel things. So that's the DIKW pyramid. Our main focus here in the lecture is of course semantics and by that it's the realm of knowledge that we are talking about. Again, so let's talk about what exactly do we mean when we talk about knowledge. What is knowledge? Okay, let's look out in the world in a more, let's say, formal way. If we look at all of the things that we see in the world, we see that there are truths out there. So every statement, every fact that we see in the world that is represented in the world is a kind of truth. Now, let us think about it. Do we know all of the truths out in the world? Of course not. So what's in my head or inside my head? This is the real of my beliefs. I have many beliefs. And of course not all of them are really in the set of the true statements. Which means there is an intersection, of course. Part of my beliefs are, of course, true. Others are not. So there are true beliefs. Are we aware of all of our true beliefs? Certainly not, because then we would, of course, then change our beliefs that are not being true. For those that are really true, as soon as we have justification for it, so that we really know that they are true, then they are justified beliefs. And this exactly is our knowledge. Knowledge are justified true beliefs. In the tripartite analysis of knowledge, you can also formalize that in the following sense, that you say S knows that P is true if and only if P, of course, has to be true. Then S believes that P is true and S is justified in believing that P is true. So you need these three components really to say what is then knowledge. Traditionally, you say, and this dates back to Aristotle, knowledge is a justified subset of all true beliefs. And what we are going to do here in the lecture is we try to represent this knowledge with a so-called formal knowledge representation so that it becomes also accessible for the machine, for the computer. And this is our ultimate goal here. However, you might say, okay, how do we share knowledge? And there is this nice saying, people can't share knowledge if they don't speak a common language. That's quite true. So that comes from Davenport and Prussia in 1997. So how can we make sure that people are speaking a common language and can exchange really the knowledge we are talking about? So first of all, we need common symbols and concepts. That's part of the so-called syntax. And of course, we have to agree about the meaning of these symbols and concepts. That would be the semantics. Within those concepts, we might have classifications and hierarchies. That's the realm of taxonomy. And also we might draw associations and relations among the concepts. Then we would have something like a thesaurus. However, that's also not enough. There are specific rules and constraints and knowledge about which relations are allowed, which relations make sense between these concepts we have. And this is something we are going to address with something which is called ontologies. So ontologies are for us in computer science formal knowledge representations and you will see then in the later parts of that course 
how we are going to define ontologies, and then how we are going to represent those ontologies in a kind of language that is understandable by the computer and that can be used, for example, also in our daily life in the web. Okay, so then, in the next lecture, let's look at knowledge and how to represent it.